name is Elizabeth Manns, and I'm doing real well today. My name is Elizabeth Manns, and I'd like to welcome you to the April 4th Coalition Show. This is the May 20th, 2024 edition of the show. The April 4th Coalition's mission statement is we are for workers' rights and collective bargaining rights and are against tax breaks for the rich and corporations who ship our jobs overseas. We support all the articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but as is our custom, we put the emphasis on Article 23 at the start of the show. Dick. All right, I'll do one and two. Everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work, and protection against unemployment. Number two, everyone without any discrimination has the right to equal pay for equal work. Number three, everyone who works has the right to just and favorable remuneration ensuring for himself or herself and his or her family an existence worthy of human dignity and supplemented if necessary by other means of social protection. And Michael. Number four. Number four. Everyone has the right to form and join trade unions for the protection of his or her interests. Very good. And as the custom, we would like to thank Michael Putnam, who is the program director for WMNBLP 107.1, for airing the audio portion of our show on Fridays at 6 p.m. and repeating it throughout the week. And of course, a thank you to Joanne Hurlbut, David Fabiano, and Nicole A. Brown, who are the fabulous staff at Northern Berkshire Community Television for helping us produce the show. Without them, there would be no show. So Dick, May 20th. Yeah. Anything exciting you want going on? Well, no, May 20th, I, th I thought we'd you know, wa watch this video uh, by the general counsel, Carla Siegel, from the Machinist Union. Um, it talks about the National Labor Relations Board. And uh, she discusses a little bit of the board's history. So. Okay. Let's, let's watch that. The National Labor Relations Board, often referred to as the NLRB, was founded in 1935. It was uh, part of the National Labor Relations Act, referred to as NLRA. And one of the main purposes of the National Labor Relations Act is to protect workers' rights to organize. It was part of the New Deal legislation um, that came out of the FDR administration and it was part of the series of laws that were put into place to boost employment and to get America out of the Great Depression. The NLRB has two main um, areas that it's involved in. The first is in protecting the workers' rights to organize. And one of the ways that it does that is when workers want to organize, they um, come together and they file a petition. They, f they sign authorization cards. The union will go out and provide authorization cards to people and explain them the benefits of, of organizing. They sign the cards which say, uh, I want to be represented by a union. And they submit that when they have sufficient cards. You submit those cards to the board, and then the board will go ahead and um, authorize an election. And then they run that election procedurally. So they will either uh, do an in-person election, usually at the work site where the workers are, or they'll do a mail ballot. They were doing more mail ballots during COVID, uh, and since then they're starting to get away from that a little bit. And they'll run that election. And one of the things that they do, that this is their second important role, is in the course of the election, they make sure that the parties uh, uh, comply with the law and don't engage in what's called an unfair labor practice. So if, for example, the workers believe that the employer is engaged in an unfair labor practice, they can file a charge with the board and then the board will investigate that and if they agree, they'll file a complaint against the employer and they'll bring them to trial in front of an administrative law judge uh, to issue a ruling that they've engaged in an unfair labor practice and then they'll order them to take steps to correct that. Of course, it's important to make sure that employers don't violate workers' rights. So, for example, we recently had an organizing ca campaign um, where uh, the employer fired three of the lead organizers uh, in that shop. We were able to go to the National Labor Relations Board, file an unfair labor 
complaint, explain to the board why this violated the law because they were they were firing these people just because of their union support. And eventually, after a trial, the National Labor Relations Board ordered the employer to reinstate these people, pay them all their back pay and any other damages that they suffered. Who's covered by the National Labor Relations Act is anybody in the private sector who's not in the railroad or the airline industry. So public sector employees, federal employees, they're governed by a separate law. Uh, the, the federal sector is, is governed by the um, Federal Labor Relations Act. The state and government local uh, governments are covered by their own laws. And then the airline and railroad employees are covered by the Railway Labor Act. So any private sector employee who wants to organize has to do so through the National Labor Relations Act. The funding of the National Labor Relations Board is done through Congress since it is a federal agency. Um, and so as you can imagine, politics is very important in that role. Uh, under the Trump administration, the goal of the Republicans was to slash the funding to the National Labor Relations Board, and they accomplished that. And they knew that by doing that, they would essentially cripple the agency. So the agency had to terminate dozens and dozens, maybe even hundreds of workers. They closed a whole bunch of different offices throughout the nation. And what that meant was everybody else who was left and still working there had their workload doubled or tripled or more. So it's very important when workers want to organize that you get to an election quickly because the longer that it takes to organize, the more time the employer has to try to twist their arms uh, and coerce them not to, and intimidate them from organizing. So by cutting the funding, one of the things that you do is you uh, will make it take longer to get to an election because there aren't enough workers to handle the election. The National Labor Relations Board will continue um, into the future to be important for the machinist members because, again, they are the federal agency that protects workers' rights and makes sure that they have the right to organize and to collectively bargain, that they have uh, protection from employers who are going to stop them from engaging in concerted activity, whether they have a union or not. Uh, workers in this country are allowed to engage in concerted activities. They're allowed to work together for their own betterment, and employers are not allowed to stop that. And if they do, the National Labor Relations Board is the agency that's going to step in and protect the workers' rights. Yep. You went over that. Um, that's come in handy, you know, for the local union here at Mass Mocha yeah. and other <laughs> local unions like the visiting, uh, the mm -hmm. B Berkshire Visiting Nurses it's Association, association. <laughs> you know, that organizing campaign. But you can see that your voting sometimes affects how effective the National Labor Relations Mission Board is. When the Republicans were in charge, they tried to kill it, you know, yeah. starve it to death. Yeah. And they'll undoubtedly try again Yeah, when, and, when they get there, unless, of course, the Democrats control the House, which is where all the budget yeah, is supposed to come right. from, and, and or the Senate. Right. When we read these, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, these are part of the uh, United Nations Universal Declaration of Human mm -hmm. Rights, but mm -hmm. they're not the law of the land. They're yeah. what should be the law of the okay. land, but they're not. The National Labor Relations Board, and, and they didn't, in, in the 1930s, they just didn't, didn't do that because, oh, let's do this, it's to be a good idea. Unions fought hard for 50 or more years to try to get these rights, mm -hmm. and it took a long time to get it. And now they're under attack. Let's watch what Robert Reich has to say. He has a, a little video that, that has uh, inspired me to, to to try to look at the National Labor Relations Act. Ladies and gentlemen, two of the richest men on the planet are trying to destroy unions once and for all. In this corner, we have Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. In the opposing border, we have organized labor and American workers. We have seen a matchup like this in almost a century. Musk's SpaceX and Bezos's Amazon are both arguing in court 
that the National Labor Relations Board is unconstitutional on the grounds that it combines judicial and executive functions. The National Labor Relations Board is the agency that supervises union organizing and collective bargaining, as established by the National Labor Relations Act of 1935, a cornerstone of FDR's New Deal that guarantees the right of workers to organize. It is, in effect, the referee of labor management relations. If Bezos and Musk get their way, two of the richest people in the world will have gutted the enforcement of labor laws designed to protect the right of average workers to unionize. Corporations could fire employees who try to organize without any repercussions. It could also be a death knell to unions that already exist. Corporate giants Starbucks and Trader Joe's have advanced similar anti-worker arguments. So much for being progressive companies, huh? Beyond their copycat legal arguments, what do all of these companies have in common? A history of bashing unions and preventing workers from exercising their right to organize. The National Labor Relations Board has charged these companies with hundreds of violations of workers' rights. These companies have fired pro-union workers, retaliated against organizers by cutting their hours, closed stores that tried to unionize, denied benefits being provided to non-union workers, and refused to bargain. And now Musk and Bezos are even going after the referees, the National Labor Relations Board, so unions and workers don't stand a chance. It's not the first time their argument has been trotted out by robber barons. A similar case made its way to the Supreme Court way back in 1937. The court's opinion in that case upheld the National Labor Relations Board and its decision to punish steel barons who fired workers who tried to organize a union. Modern day robber barons, Bezos and Musk, are hoping today's Supreme Court will reverse its 1937 ruling and return America to a time before workers had a referee to ensure their rights. Evidently, it's not enough for Bezos and Musk to amass more wealth than any two people in the planet. No, they want even more wealth and covet even more power and don't want to share it with their workers. You see, unions are one of the greatest champions of equality. And unions don't just help unionized workers, they help all workers. There's a ripple effect that occurs when workers organize. Non-union workers often receive the benefits of higher wages and safer working conditions fought for by organized labor. Unions also play a political role. They provide countervailing power to the overwhelming political power of giant corporations. We will all suffer if unions are not there to have the backs of workers. Now, these cases may take a while to snake their way through the courts. In the meantime, please share this video. Musk and Bezos win this fight only if the public doesn't know what's happening. And support your local unions. When they go on strike, join a picket line. Better yet, join a union if you can. We all need to voice our support for organized labor. Now, more than ever. You did a good job. He did, and oh, and it's shocking that millionaires want more money, isn't it? Yeah, well, they just... <laughs> and stuff, and, you know, and, and yeah. They only uh, want one thing, and that's everything. They want everything, right, <laughs> right. You know, go, you know, they don't want to worry about anybody else getting there. You take know, as much as you can take pie. in there quick, if anybody knows he's gone. Yeah. Give me some of that, give me that, give me yeah. that. Give me that, give me that, give me that. You know, and yeah, and we all know the Supreme Court and their belief on subtle law, since yeah. obviously they were per they all said Roe versus Wade was subtle law, and they were the first chance right. they got they gutted They're it. They're not to be trusted. They're so, not to be trusted, and not, that's why it's very important not to have Donald Trump as president because mm -hmm. those oh, yeah. two older ones will resign, and they'll get we'll, we'll get be stuck with people that think like them for another three generations. generations. You oh, know, so we have to do what we can. Yes. I was driving through Cambridge yesterday, and make a little oh. segue, and there was a, 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 a ceasefire demonstration going on towards Mass Avenue. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, we, we'd uh, share a little bit of information. Uh, I, this woman was on uh, Amira Haas, who is an Israeli, uh, who, who uh, is a reporter, 
Eight years ago, she made a video at Duke University talking about the Arab, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, situation. Uh, let's listen to her because she was on Democracy Now! and uh, she talked again last week. But let's hear what she had to say eight years ago. This is Duke University. There is one country with two, two peoples in it, who live in it, the Israeli Jewish people and the Palestinian people. Uh, both peoples have the right to self-determination. Only the Jews, the Israeli Jews, have attained their right of self-determination. The Palestinians have not yet. And the third principle, or the guiding principle, is the, that of equality. Without equality, uh, we cannot envisage life, uh, uh, a, a good life for the two peoples in the country. How we, will, how we translate this principle of equality uh, into reality depends on the two peoples, depends on the intervention of the world. My name is Amira Haas. I work for the Israeli daily Haaretz. I'm reporting from the occupied Palestinian territory. I used to live in Gaza, now I live in the West Bank, in Ramallah. The people that I address the information to and uh, address in my mind when I write the Israelis do not have, uh, do not want to know, so they do not read. The Israelis for the past 20 years uh, were led to believe, but very willingly led to believe, that they are, the, they are being attacked by, Palestine, by the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. That they are uh, not occupiers anymore since Israel, since Oslo. There is a Palestinian authority. The Israeli army is not in the main cities. Mm -hmm. So it is, there is no real occupation. There is no occupation anymore. So what do they, what do they complain, the Palestinians? Mm -hmm. And this is another challenge to, to, to fight against a very, very heavy machine, uh, machinery of, of uh, propaganda, Israeli propaganda. But it is not just the propaganda that you can, it is not that there is a ministry of propaganda that is fabricating all this, uh, this information. But the people themselves want to, be, want to be misled. They want to be, they want not to know. People do not want to disrupt their, uh, the fake normal, normality in which they live. Knowing might disrupt it. Knowing that it is not normal to uh, dominate for almost 50 years, uh, to control Palestinians for almost 50 years without giving them uh, uh, the right to vote, uh, to uh, decide about their life, to take their land, to decide about their uh, small details such as marriage, not small, but as marriage, as uh, having a family, seeing family. Uh, Israelis do not want to be bothered by this information that uh, is so Israeli. This information is about Israeli policies. It is not about Palestinians. It is part of, of, of um, struggle on, on resources, nature resources. It is part of the division between, between empire, uh, American empire or Western empire, Western imperialism, and the way that they try to dominate the uh, uh, other parts of the world. So we have to take into effect, to, into also, I think, also consideration the, the danger of brutalization and irreversible brutalization. That's why one has to think about ways of, of resistance uh, which may impede the potential of brutalization. I very much doubt if Israel would have existed or the way it had it existed if not for the Holocaust or if the Zionist project would have been so successful, if not for the Holocaust. They saw themselves as Jews, both my parents. One, my mother in Yugoslavia, my father in Romania. And they, they felt, okay, as Jews, we should not, we should not, we shouldn't, we don't, we don't feel anything to do with nation, the idea of a nation state. We feel both. My mother felt a Yugoslav, my father felt Romanian. But after the Holocaust, after Bergen Belsen, after my father was in a ghetto, they sense what many other Jews sensed in Europe, that they are not welcome. They returned from the concentration camps or ghettos or the hiding places, and they felt that they were not welcome. And not only in East, in East Europe, but also in West, Western Europe. It's a common experience of many Jews also in, uh, in, in Holland, in France, in Belgium. One has to understand the historical context, which is always very important for me to tell to Palestinians mainly.
that yes, Israel has very strong uh, uh, characteristics of a colonialist uh, entity, colonialist society. Zionism is very much uh, 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 integrated into the worldview of colonialist uh, Europe of the 19th century, uh, which did not see the natives in the countries which it colonized. But this is not the only story of Zionism and of the Israeli state. Uh, because Zionism was also one of the responses that the Jewish communities looked for uh, when they fought or when they were uh, 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 looked for ways to, to, to get away from anti-Semitism and persecution. And this is very hard to reconcile. I'm not trying to reconcile between the two. I say one has to understand the historical sequence, uh, but it is not in order to exonerate Israel. But this is also a way for me to tell Palestinians you cannot, you cannot just compare Israel uh, or the Israeli colonialist uh, project or the Jewish colonialist project to, let's say, French colonialist project in Algeria. The PNR had a place to go to. Brits, I mean, whites in, in South Africa had a place to go to or a culture to go to. The Israelis do not have a place. We do, we, we, okay, we can emigrate, etc. Well, but we will not find something which is similar to Israeli culture elsewhere. It is so tragic and so infuriating that, uh, that the refuge that Israel became to so many, so many of the survivors uh, and the, the, the establishment of the state of Israel actually uh, was at the account of at the expense of Palestinians and caused this disaster to the Palestinian life. The more I live among Palestinians, the more I understand the, 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 the scope of this disaster of losing their home, really losing their homeland. Produced by Duke University. Well, mm -hmm. she really gives a perspective on that. She does, and it's mm -hmm. one you don't think about often. I mean, I, I get the collective guilt that created Israel to begin with. In World War II, I, I always knew it was collective guilt in Europe that required that, got that imposition in and stuff. But for some reason, and now I think you're seeing the backlash of the collective guilt of what's happening to the Palestinians is now bubbling to right. the surface. I hear a lot of talk about it's colonialism because what it is is it's a culture has come in and taken over no, the Palestinians. Yeah. Drove, driven them out of the land. Mm -hmm. But what she says there is there's a difference between like the colonialism of the Americas when they settled mm -hmm. here, they, you know, they, and, and, and even in South Africa or when the French were in mm -hmm. Algiers, they were, they were colonizing those people, but they could always go home. There was a home to go, go to. to. Mm -hmm. But here, the Jews have no place to go. Yeah. So it puts them in a really it, tough situation. But then on the other hand, the Palestinians, you know, they've been driven off their land. Yeah, yeah. So how, how do we reconcile it? We don't have time to show what she said last Friday on mm -hmm. Democracy Now!, yeah. but you know, she, she said that in 1992 there was a chance. Mm -hmm. Israel had a chance to say, let's forget about all that history and let's just establish a Palestinian state. Okay. And mm -hmm. so they can have their own country, mm -hmm. they can have their right to vote and their authority over it. Right. So right now, that's where we're at. Again. Are we going to fight through all of history and argue about history, or are we going to move forward and provide people with the basic human rights mm -hmm. yes, to exist? Just... All of them. Mm -hmm. Right now, because it's so confrontational, the fringes, the very radicals, are, 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 are causing everybody to be in chaos. Correct, they are. And uh, I don't, I mean, we've, we've heard about the two-state solution multiple times, and it takes the will of both parties to create it. They have to agree to let go and to respect each other. And I, I just, I'm not sure, I mean, this war is gonna create another generation, this battle that's going on right now in the Palestinian land in Gaza and whatnot, it's gonna create another generation that isn't going, to, right. isn't going to trust. You're not gonna be able to kill an idea. No. You, you know, you can't wipe out the idea of the No, but you can delay it. That's all, well, you and know. I that's, think that's the, the one goal. state solution that a lot of people talk about is just <clears throat> give everybody the right to vote. 
mm -hmm. that lives in that country. Mm -hmm. Right. Whether you're Palestinian or Jew. But then, you know, it's not an easy solution that way either. No, no. it's not. Because you know you're going to have one loser somewhere. Yeah. And you don't want to be that one person in one country that goes down. Yeah. So if they got to go in, they got a whole set of rules, and there's a possibility they can get beat. I don't think they'll do it. I don't think they'll take the chance. Right. And well, there's mm -hmm. this, but what's going on right now has to stop. It does. I agree. It has it's to not, stop. It's not going. It's not going to provide a solution. It's not going to give independence to Palestinians, because that isn't what Hamas wants. Hamas wants Israel off the map. They want right, but those are the some, radicals. In, in, in what I think not, Netanyahu yeah. has done is he didn't want a two-state solution, so he supported Hamas. Mm -hmm. He supported giving money to Hamas. He wanted them because that separated. When you had Hamas in charge of Gaza and the PLO uh, and the Palestinian Authority in charge Chacha. of, of the, the, the West Bank, that one, they weren't unified. They, they, were, they were keeping them separate. Divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what he did. And uh, I, it's, I, I got to believe that, the, that these people uh, uh, you know, had so many universities that have been destroyed in Palestine mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. They had school and medicine. They're very mm -hmm. dedicated mm -hmm. people. Um, mm -hmm. There's two people, and they want one piece of land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder why um, <clears throat> Netanyahu um, bombed um, hospitals and um, uh, pe where he knew people um, were that were civilians. And did, did he think that um, Hamas was hiding there in these particular places because they knew that they would not bomb a hospital or a university. Did that come into some of his m mind? Is that some of I his? Can't, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm just know. thinking, you know, why right. did he But there are this? rules of war, and you're you supposed know? to protect the private the citizen. citizen. Yeah. So you can't really. just drop a 2,000-pound yeah. bomb on an apartment building just because you want to kill mm -hmm. one person in the I building know. and then but, kill yeah. all the other innocents. Uh, it's just a really tough thing. I think uh, if you get a chance, watch Democracy Now! last Friday. Mm -hmm. You can call it up, or maybe we'll show it at another date. But, you know, she really ha she says a lot of the same things that she said eight years ago, but she takes it in the context of what happened on October 7th. Right now. But she still says that, you know, people have to believe in a future. If they want a future of peace, they're going to have to go to a peaceful solution. Right. They, if they want to continue <laughs> generations of war, then they got to continue, continue on the road they're on. Yeah, exactly. And we're going to say power to the people. To the people. And remember, power poverty the is the enemy back there. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. There's power in a five tree. Thank you.